you bow like that, or to enter a room, or to close it. One of the things you do in Shambhala is you actually do a warrior. It's more a warrior posture and a warrior tradition. So um, this, so I'm going to introduce this just, just, um, just to let you know, just to give you information. In Shambhala tradition, we would bow. So let's just bow. We'll bow in, and basically, it's acknowledging. You're acknowledging your own strength and um, the the and respect for oneself and also for the other person at the same time. So, um, there aren't too many of us. There's going to be a lot of room for questions. So, my name is Cynthia Neen. I'm the uh, Director of Practice and Education here. Um, I am the, I'm the author of a couple of things, and so um, I'm an author of this book, which is, which won an award as one of the best spiritual books of 2003. And I'm the author of this, which is called Shambhala Warrior Training, which came out uh, 10 years ago, uh, from Sounds True, also about the Shambhala tradition. And then I'll tell you about those two books in a bit. Anyway, I've been, I'm a, a Kudo practitioner, so Zen archery, practice that. And basically, I've been a practitioner for 35 years. So, so I started when I was five. <laughs> um, and I'm a student. I have many teachers at this point. My root teacher, this notion of root teacher in Buddhism, root being like um, the um, sort of the ba- your the first person or the fundamental person who showed you the nature of your mind and the nature of reality and then from that it's like a tree a lot of things branch out so my root teacher was Trungpa Rinpoche and um, and I have probably five or six teachers at this point Um, certainly take teaching from many many more people than that but those where I really feel um, that I have a commitment uh, to fulfill what they've asked me to do. So that's kind of, and if you were re- if, like, if you're really, really strong, you could have 37 or 38 teachers, but it gets to be a little demanding. Um, now I first moved to Boulder in uh, you know, 74 and then came back about six months later as a co-founder of Naropa. So, um, so I've been in Boulder for quite a while, did move away for 14 years and um, then came back. Um, have worked a lot in the business world, and I guess that's it. <laughs> so, um, how many people, ha- is this the first time that you've been here? One, two, okay, great. Um, how about just a few times? Oh, okay. I already know a lang, because I've asked him to, <laughs> to do me a favor um, this coming week. But anyway, why why did you come? What um, what sparked your interest? Well, I've, I've been sort of practicing on my own. Good. And practicing meditation. Yeah. So I thought, you know, this has been good for a long time, I think. Yeah, it has. It's it started. The center started in uh, 1970, and the first building, the first site was actually 1971, 1111 Pearl Street, and this has been here since like 76, this building. Yeah, Yeah, so you thought you would investigate, you know, curious. Okay. I I came just to uh, to get out of the norm and see some new stuff. Are you a long-time resident of, or a CU student, or? I went to uh, grown up in Aurora. In Aurora? Okay. So, yeah, I'm from Colorado mostly. And then, uh, kid got the, I think, an email about it. Some kind of an email, yeah. I just oh. thought that was something to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, good. Did you stay for Kudo? We just saw it, yeah. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. Anyone else? Yeah, I think it's really good. Curious about 
like the medi- the, how the meditation practice is made different or similar or to to what like the vipassana or oh vipassana tradition yeah. so vipassana buddhist tradition what really is shambhala what makes it unique yeah that kind of thing okay i, I don't know much about shambhala as a whole so right right okay good Basically, I was just asking um, why people are here, if they're new or been here a few times, or I what the curiosity is. I can just sit and know this is going on. <laughs> I figured, hey, why not just talk to so. <laughs> Okay. Alain? Huh? Any? Did you come for any special reason? Well, I'm about to be here since 70. Okay, good enough. All right. Um, the topic is what is Shambhala, so it should hopefully address a couple of things. Um, there are two things going, there are two lineages here, there are two traditions. And um, like, um, like sort of flowing into one stream. These two traditions are Shambhala and Buddhism. And they come, they, they both come together, so they're discreet in a certain sense. Um, they came to us through Trungpa Rinpoche, was this this gentleman, so um, a Tibetan, a very high lama, called a lama in that tradition, um, but a very accomplished meditation master and poet and artist and scholar and so on. Um, so when the Chinese moved into Tibet, a lot of what's called the Dharma, Dharma means truth or uh, like code of life or reality and or how things are. And uh, so Dharma, particularly Buddha Dharma, was pushed out of Tibet uh, and brought to the West because by a lot of refugees, basically people who were fleeing. So um, Trungpa Rinpoche brought these two traditions, Shambhala and Buddhism, and um, that's my root teacher. And then his, the current lineage holder is his eldest son, Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche. So that's the person over there. And... Um, I think I'm going to alter some of the things I was going to say based on your interest. Um, Buddhism, as you know, started in India 2,500 years ago, roughly. And um, it flourished, it flourished, it flourished, and then at a certain point it disappeared from from India. Uh, So if you went, so it doesn't really exist there today. except by refugee communities and so on. Um, it, from India, it went to various places, Sri Lanka, um, Southeast Asia, Korea, China, and so on. It also went to Tibet. And, um, okay, so that's one strain is Buddhism. In Tibet, Tibet was as you also know, very protected by mountain ranges, very uh, separate from influences that were going on in other places in the world. So things, so the practice really flourished there, the practice of Buddhism. Although even in Tibet, it has, there is, um, there is an explosion or expansion of interest. And when Buddhism uh, first comes to uh, Tibet and it flourishes, and then it's basically kind of wiped out, the, or, or at least very, very diminished. And then a second wave comes, um, and it's fully established. And now, of course, Tibet is probably disappearing, as an ethnic group at least. Um, so there are two waves of Buddhism in Tibet. All of this, all of what we, we um, practice here came through Drumpa Rinpoche. So it, can, it comes through that Tibetan tradition. And he was also, as you probably know, very um, very contemporary and even somewhat controversial. Um, he arrived in the West as, uh, as a high lama wearing traditional robes and so on. And at a certain point, he felt he wasn't getting through to his students. And a number of things happened. And he finally um, has insight about how to proceed. At that point, he takes off the robes, he starts smoking Marlboro cigarettes, drinking, drinking alcohol, and so on. And he, and he's, um, he became 
very contemporary and is widely regarded by um, Tibetan Buddhists, uh, Zen Buddhists, um, all kinds of historical schol scholars of history and so on, is the person who actually did it, who actually brought authentic, the, the authentic tradition fully to the West. So, um, a very unusual person. Um, there, are two, there are two statues of this shrine. One of them is, is associated with the old school. There were like two waves in Tibet. One is associated with the old school, this first implanting of um, Buddhism in the West, and one of them is associated with the new school. And we are, we're inheritors of those two streams. It's, and I'm gonna stop talking about all this scholarly stuff in a minute, or it's interesting? Oh, okay. So um, there, are, there are four main schools, we're still on Buddhism now, there are four main schools of Tibetan, of Buddhism in Tibet. One is the old, is the old, the ancients, the first planting of it, very, very strong in practice. The second, another one is what's called the new translation school, very, very strong in practice. A third one is a family line that um, called, I won't give you the names, but anyway, a family line very, um, that was actually almost wiped out when, during the Chinese invasion. And um, the head of it and his sister were the only two who survived and they moved to Vancouver and it's now flourishing in Vancouver. And the fourth one is, was mostly, was more associated with government, it's so actual political activity, and that's the Dalai Lama. So those are like the four, so two practice schools, one very associated with, and two very associated with scholarship. Um, one surviving in Vancouver and um, flourishing again, and the other the Dalai Lama. So, okay, so Shambhala, so that's Tibetan Buddhism. And um, this, this room, this, this hall is, has a lot of touches of Tibetan tradition. If you went to a Zendo, like you're curious about what Zen practice is, or if you went to a martial art, like if you went to the dojo, um, that Sensei has for um, Kudo, for Zen archery. Um, colors are very subdued. Things are very, very simplified. If you did in other martial arts uh, where you were going to um, practice simplicity of some kind, maybe you, would, you might meditate just sitting for a bit. Um, the colors, again, would be very, very, um, they'd be subdued, they'd be browns, blacks, and so on. Um, once you walk into a hall like this, with all of this, like, flair and so on, you know immediately, you may not know anything, but you know immediately, this is Tibetan. Um, okay, so two lineages, one Buddhist, uh, one Shambhala, and I practice both. Um, now, we'll just, we'll talk about Shambhala. The, in, the Shambhala tradition, Shambhala is the basic notion of it, if you remember nothing, is this. It's the um, notion of enlightened society or decent society. So, um, a, a society that's, uh, that's progressive, that's um, prosperous, where, that's based on fundamental goodness, acknowledging the fundamental goodness of human beings, both in us and between us, and with the environment. So it doesn't mean to say that it, that there aren't, um, there, that there wouldn't be jails in Shambhala or anything like that, but the fundamental notion is that no one is unworkable, and no situation is unworkable. So you might still, you might land in jail, or somebody might land, land in jail mm -hmm. in, in a decent society, but the fundamental ground is um, very, very basic, what's called primordial goodness or basic goodness uh, in humans, between humans, and with the environment. Um, so 
uh, notion of, of a decent society, the, um, the one way of talking about it, very traditional to, if you study Tibetan Buddhism, or if you study with a Tibetan master, put it that way, um, there are, the, maybe because they were cut off by mountains and um, they you know, had a lot of time on their hands, I have no idea, but there's a lot of, they're very, very sophisticated practices. They're very, very, or, or very refined practices, subtle and, um, and uh, really, really kind of kind of hold you perfectly your sanity and your sanity. And um, also the category. They said that maybe exi it existed in, Mongo in uh, Mongolia or Afghanistan, Pakistan. So it's like, it's a notion of like an actual society. It's believed to be the source of our notion of Shangri-La. So we have this Shangri-La from, probably from this novel that was written in the 30s or whenever it was written. Um, but anyway, Historically, this external meaning, this outer meaning also, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the past. It's like, well, it could be in the present or could be in the future, but it really is a society that's decent, that's um, wholesome, where genuine wisdom tradition can flourish, where the essence of humanity and the dignity of human beings is actually, and of animals and everything, and the environment is actually um, cultivated and protected. So that, in that sense, could be in the past, in the present, or in the future. So that's one meaning, this external meaning. Inner meaning of Shambhala is um, that it doesn't really matter whether it existed historically or not, or ever will exist. It's that in the human psyche, just intrinsically as part of human vision, all human beings have this notion in the in human psyche or this aspiration to to live in a decent society. So in that sense, it doesn't really matter whether it existed or not. So that's the inner meaning, and you see it in um, lead. I mean, everybody knows this. You see it in leadership studies. You see it in children's stories. Um, you see it in myths of various cultures. So in that sense, it's cross cultural. So it could. Um, there are pockets of it all over the globe, and there have been, and there will be. There's that sense that that this is something intrinsic in us, this aspiration to live in a good society. Um, for example, I have a friend who's from Iran and had to flee because of the uh, political situation, but her family is still there, her uh, her parents. And she, when she first read um, this book, which is Trumpa Rinpoche's um, The Shambhala Teachings, when she first read it, um, she said, I'm going to translate this into Farsi. She said, even though, she said, even though Iran now um, she's, you know, has a lot of political turmoil, um, she said, basically, the Persian people know that governments come and go. She said, this, but this is Persian teaching, this is teaching us, this is so similar to what we, what the people know, not the governments, but the people themselves. So that's like the inner sense, or the inner meaning. So then there's also a secret meaning. And this again is very typical of um, Tibetan way of uh, approaching things. It's also, I find it very handy to um, understand life. So outer, inner, secret. So secret is secret in the sense of self-secret. In other words, it's personal. Self-secret meaning of Shambhala is that, and this is the one that Drumpa Rinpoche, he taught, he emphasized all three of these. And probably what makes us unique is, um, is, to, actually, is to actually dig into this self-secret part. So self-secret is that the, the meaning of Shambhala is, is uh, completely accessible right now and in one's everyday experience. So this is the sense where you don't have to 
you just have to dig a little bit beneath the surface of ordinary consciousness. So you don't have to go very far, but just beneath, just beneath our ordinary preoccupation, there is a subtlety and a patterning of energies that's fundamentally decent, fundamentally awake, fundamentally skillful, and um, very, very rich, very pragmatic, very realistic, everything that one needs to be um, a decent human being and to have a good society. So that, of course, exists in the present moment um, in one's personal experience. So it's at the experiential level, just slightly below our concepts of and our interpretations of um, what we think is going on. So that's why, for example, we we sit. In both these traditions, Buddhism and Shambhala, the fundamental foundation, the, the one method that's common to them both is going to be the sitting practice of meditation and a certain style of doing it. Um, because it's, it's basically about uh, waking up to our own resources, using, using our senses, opening our senses, engaging in the richness of life and engaging more and more as one tries to um, act and, and um, be effective. The, one of these two, one of these two statues the one on this side, on your left, is um, associated with something called hidden treasure teaching. So Buddhism goes to uh, Tibet, it flourishes for some centuries, and then it begins to be very, very threatened by the political order and crushed. So the 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 um, figure represented on this side of the main shrine is associated with hiding treasure or hidden treasure teaching. And um, specifically, Shambhala is said to be a hidden treasure teaching. It's this notion, the, the notion historically is that, is that certain teachings were, um, were hidden to be appropriate to surface at another time. So they were hidden in rocks, hidden in, um, in various places in Tibet, hidden in water. It's said, and we don't have time to go into this, but said, it's said that it's hidden in the sky, it's hidden in the minds of great practitioners. The, the, the notion that I want you to take away is the notion of something valuable that's accessible, that's hidden from our view. So now, you know, back to our everyday experience, this style of hidden treasure teaching is that there's something, there are energies, or there is an essence of our being that's just below the surface that we, we touch, that everybody can experience, and that we do experience, and just simple experiences when our senses are open. Um, that we, we, as human beings, we, we open, we veer away, we open, we veer away. There's a, there's a sense in the Shambhala tradition that, um, that there's something about our nature and there's something about, that's valuable in the sense that it will help us it will help others around us, that we're just, we're, we're not seeing, or we're seeing and we're not recognizing it, or we're, we're um, veering away from it because it's not valued in the culture. Um, it just, but the sense of something of value that's hidden from our view. Now what that means is that like if you, in, in a treasure teaching, if something is hidden, it's like gold or um, oil or, um, sapphires or precious jewels, anything that's hidden is that you don't see it. And then when you find it, you say, oh, it was there all along. So that's like, that's like the key logical point. 
is that it was always there. You just didn't see it. You weren't looking in the right way, didn't care to look, didn't know it had any value, regarded it as a throwaway, whatever. But that, that kind of, tra the, the sense of it is that, oh, it was there the whole time. That's also true in the Buddhist tradition, this notion of enlightenment. Enlightenment is not, the notion of enlightenment is actually, it's very misunderstood in the West. The notion is not that there's something that you don't have and you have to get it. The notion is in both this treasure, this hidden treasure style, um, also true in Buddhism, is that it's an uncovering process, it's a discovering process. It's a finding something that was always there, that was never not there. So it has to do, so it has to do with your own, one's own nature and the nature of, of um, the world. So basically this is saying that there's no fundamental flaw. The logic is, is that you have what you need, you just, you, meaning you and me, just don't know it, or know it and keep forgetting it. It's like that. So, for example, enlightenment, this notion, it took me for years, I didn't, even, you know, though I was a really serious student, I absolutely did not understand. But it's the same as, like, the notion is, like, of a wake, it's just an analogy. And the analogy is that if you want to sleep, so you go to sleep at night, and the alarm goes off and you wake up. The notion of waking up is that the ceiling, the floor, the carpet, all of that was there while you were sleeping. You just didn't see it. You know, you wake up and you realize, oh, it was there the whole time. It's like that. So that's like a very kind of key point. Um, this. Shambhala tradition as a tradition of decent society or enlightened society is a very much an umbrella approach. Um, umbrella meaning it's a, it's a big uh, space for all genuine traditions to flourish. Genuine meaning um, traditions that actually uh, care for the essence of human, of human beings and um, therefore called wisdom traditions, believe in the goodness, the endless and beginningless goodness of human beings. So umbrella approach, that would mean, and it does mean that like you could be a, a Shambhala Christian, you could be a Shambhala Jewish practitioner, you could be Shambhala um, Sufi, you could be Shambhala atheist, you could be Shambhala Buddhist. So big, big notion of society. At the same time, um, fundamentally, what I've said is that the fundamental notion is that there's no original sin, there's no original flaw. Now, you can't, there's no way, I, I mean, I'm not trying to sell you on this, but that's the discovery that's the discovery of sitting meditation. Is that, there, you, is that there's actual, you come into the present over and over and over and over again as much as you can. And in the present moment, there's actually not, you take your being apart. Here you are, you know, you're a completely screwed up person or you're completely, you know, whatever. You're a completely delightful, wonderful person. I mean, whatever it is. But there's something underneath that which is one's nature. And that with a little bit of sitting and a little bit of investigation, one develops conviction, confidence, let's say, that there's actually no fundamental flaw. Now, is that stable? No. Do we, does it take a lot of exertion and practice? Yes. To actually gain confidence, more and more confidence, until finally you have conviction. But that's the fun, that's the basic, the basic method in Shambhala and Buddhism is sitting practice. In, in Shambhala, actually let me say it this way, the basic beginning of Shambhala and the basic result or the fruition or conclusion of um, both Buddhism and Shambhala, it's the same. But the path, the methods, are very, very different. Mostly what you see in this room are um, representations of, Tibet, of Tibetan Buddhist method. 
um, the Kudo Shambhala method. That and there's going to be tour and or I actually can say some things about it now, but that shrine over there is representing Shambhala method. So in, I can just tell you like one, two of the things, well, there's several things that make it look different. One of them is that at the very top, there's a, a, um, uh, a bamboo pressed, uh, this sort of pressed wood that's decorated in a very, okay, so that's a Yumi actually. That's, um, and Sensei, who was just giving the uh, Kyoto demonstration and talk, that's actually, that's um, from Zen Archery, but decorated, and Sensei decorated it. Um, so it's a ceremonial one. And um, the Ya, it's called a Yumi, the Ya is there, the arrow on each side. Obviously those are indicating, oh, this is now a warrior tradition. Um, even though we don't know really what warrior means yet. But um, that would into, that would click you to, oh, Shambhala. Um, the, there's a brush in the very middle that's got a black tip. The black tip is from ink. So it's, a, it's representing a calligraphy practice. So again, oh, Shambhala. I mean, we know Buddhists did, you know, practice various arts of, of certain kinds, but that will indicate um, that it's a Shambhala shrine, but most of the things in here are representing the Buddhist path. Path is method, so different methods. So when I say I'm a practitioner, I'm sitting um, in both traditions and also doing various, practicing methods that are unique to these, um, these two traditions. Um, I'm going to leave time for questions, but let me say one more thing. The, the Buddhism 2,500 years old, very, very long tradition in many, many uh, cultures, a long tradition of very great personalities and scholarship and commentary and people passing on their understanding person to person for, and their experience person to person for 2,500 years. Very, very rich and um, sophisticated. Shambhala, well, from one point of view, it's older than Buddhism because the Buddha taught there. It, Shambhala, uh, some say disappeared some say it was real and it disappeared. It was kept with, alive within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition among the, among the elite. So if you were a very high lama or very accomplished meditation master, you would hear about Shambhala. Um, but most of the people in Tibet did not. There is a practice called the Kala Chakra, which is Sanskrit for Wheel of Time. That that funny, that sort of odd looking, um, like that thing over there. <laughs> it's actually called Torma, but that's actually from, Kala, from a Kala Chakra ceremony that was done. Inside the Kala Chakra, it's the most advanced, um, it's the mo there's something called Tantra. In Buddhist Tantra, in Tibetan Buddhist Tantra, Kala Chakra is the most advanced of the lower Tantras. And inside it, it's a very complex practice. Inside it, it mentions Shambhala. It mentions enlightened society. It mentions warriors of Shambhala. It mentions kings of Shambhala. And it says that this will actually be, this is a teaching that's going to come out from being in hiding it will come out when the world needs it, and it predicts when the world needs it. It will be in a time when there are iron airplane, uh, iron, large iron birds. I mean, it says things like this, like presumably are airplanes, um, and so on. But it doesn't give any of the any of the sort of uh, inner meaning. The inner meaning was handed teacher to student among the very elite, Trungpa Rinpoche is regarded as a, um, there are names for these things, but he's regarded as a person who suddenly 
remembered what was forgotten, suddenly remembered what needed to come out. Um, this began, this began, while he was in Tibet, there was a Shambhala text, it was lost in the last river that they were crossing, having crossed the mountains. It was, um, it was, this text was lost in the river, disappeared. He comes to the West, he presents for eight, seven or eight years, where he, this will be, you'll find in Buddhism. But the real specialty of Shambhala is that, is that we're coming into a time when the dignity of human beings is very, very much in question. And when the world is very, very, it's a much smaller world, as you know, than even the world of our, of our parents' time. So when certain things are, when the, when the world has tremendous difficulty, and something that is not religious, something that, is, that crosses culture, something that is just so basic to human beings, needs to come out. So these, so that's its uniqueness, that's its specialty, is that, is to cultivate and promote this, the, the sense of life force and um, essence of humanity and kind of the code of life and protect it and so on. So um, all of Shambhala teaching is trying to address that one issue. So when, when I say calligraphy practice or ikebana or kudo and so on, like in, you know, you might find it entertaining. The reason I first started kudo is I just saw it being demonstrated. And I was a smoker and I thought, well, that'll help me quit smoking. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a very, it's an eight and a half foot bow. And um, the way you open it, as you've seen in the demo, is that you can't, you can't open it like a Western bow. You have to really, you know, open it like this and really open up your chest and um, but it's not actually about and you could meditate to learn to play bridge better or to drive a, a sports car better things like that but the fundamental meaning is much more subtle um, of kudo of ikebana of all these um, shambhala methods as well as obviously buddhist method and it's it, shambhala is really digging down a little deep into that into that essence of you. And um, so it's a warrior tradition. It's a warrior tradition, not in the sense of, um, of making war or fighting with guns, although that might be what you do. Uh, one of my friends is actually in Iran, and he's a, he's a Buddhist and a Shambhalian, and he's engaged in, he's a, you know, I'm sure they don't call it that, but I mean, he's a foot soldier. He's not a general or anything like this. Um, but so you might, you might be a soldier, but that's not what's brave about you. What's brave about you in the Shambhala tradition is that you have, rec you, you have recognized the essence of your humanity, and it's fundamentally gentle. It's all these qualities, these noble qualities, fundamentally, they're there, and it's a question of discovering it and then having the bravery to bring it forward more. So it's a, it's a tradition of warriorship that's a notion of bravery, of being, of being willing to bring, bring the essence of your humanity and engage the essence as you do what you do, which might be driving a car or fighting in Iran. It might be cooking your eggs or um, engaging in a conversation. It's just is that you engage the essence of your humanity as you do what you do, and, and that's your bravery. So your bravery is always unique to your situations, and my bravery is unique to mine. So it's very penetrating and very direct in that way. i got to stop talking. Um, I'll give you a chance to talk. But that's like, that's like the uniqueness of it, um, and that's what it's working to promote, to cultivate, to protect, um, in in that's what like ikebana. It's not just flower arranging. Uh, kudo. It's not just archery. Like you can go. Kudo is practiced in Japan today. Um, and the point in Japan when it's practiced is to hit the target, hit the target, hit the target, hit the target. But kudo, the, the meaning of kudo is not only preserved with um, treasures like Shibata Sensei. And um, only in like Buddhist monasteries, the meaning is your is Zen archery. You're actually working with your mind, working with your 
you know, you're working with your your humanity, like getting, um, making it, having it come forward more. Um, okay, we've got about 10 minutes left, 13 minutes. Any um, questions or comments? Anything at all, you can ask me anything. Yes. Like how I'll repeat it in case I don't know if this is being recorded, but I, I don't. I'm not sure how to really phrase this question. That's okay. Um, how does like Shambhala view like the individual's e- ego structure, and how does that come into the practice as well? And, and it's a good question. Um, so if everyone didn't, if no, if people didn't hear it, how does basically how does Shambhala relate to talk about ego and ego structure, which Buddhism talks about a lot. Um, Shambhala doesn't really talk about it. It, um, it, the notion of egolessness is there, but it kind of goes. It kind of it doesn't do extensive analysis of ego. It's more the basis, the fundamental basis of it is realizing that there's something unconditionally good about you and actually experiencing that. And then the very next step, which sounds simple, is bringing is being genuine actually bringing out the texture of your own experience, experiencing your experience 100%. So it, it, kind of, it kind of undercuts ego right away because ego doesn't want to do that. So, but so Shambhala will talk about, so we, one, we, that's very difficult to do to actually be genuine and true, moment, moment to moment. We veer away, so why do we veer away? That's where Shambhala says, well, um, fear arises. Why does fear arise? One investigates that. In Shambhala tradition, you use fear. You use fear. You welcome fear. Because you learn, learn, learn. So it, it comes up like that. And fundamentally, as the warrior as this the warrior tradition of Shambhala, as it um, matures, they bo- both Buddhism and Shambhala have this, the fundamental insight is that, is egolessness in both traditions, but the language is different. So in, it's, and it's a maturing of insight. Like each of them, the foundation is that insight. It's the same insight. But as they, as the tradition, mature, as, it, as you mature in these two traditions, your, the, the language that's used by your teachers is different. In the Shambhala tradition, the maturing is authentic presence. In the Buddhist tradition, it's um, it's to be a noble-hearted person, bodhisattva. Then finally, an awake person, a Buddha. And then finally, um, in the Tibetan tradition, finally a Haruka, which is uh, Buddha is usually seated. Haruka, they're off their feet. They're like this. <laughs> I mean, off their off their seat, you know, so get, but it's, it's a really good question, but the, the basic notion is that there's insight in both traditions into that ego doesn't really exist. Just kind of, it's kind of a mis, an attitude, a mistake that we make, and then as it matures in different ways. It's a good question. Anyone else? Any question at all? How um, how is the two the, the Shambhala and the Buddhist? How they, how well do they blend? That's another good question. How well do they br- blend? They blend really well. <laughs> um, and in fact, some people would say, um, "Well, I'm a Shambhala Buddhist." They blend really well. Why? Can you guess? Well, not exactly the intention. Something more fundamental. The fundamental basis is the same. The fundamental basis is the same. Yeah. Are they sort of complementary? Well, they're complementary, definitely. The key, what I'm looking for, <laughs> what I'm looking for is, is, the ba- is the insight. The insight is the same. So, the, you know, it's no accident that Shambhala was 
preserved within Buddhist tradition. And it's no accident that, like when, when, that as other traditions resonate with this, what they're resonating with is that, is that fundamental non-duality, if you will. You know, that fundamental, um, something fundamental that, that's more fundamental than a religious sect or a, uh, or a nation or a culture even. Something very, very basic. And um, so the insight is the same. The insight is a personal experience. And the personal experience is discovered on the cushion. On the, on the cushion? On the cushion. On, in sitting practice. I mean, there, there's also another, if I can just say one more thing, like the... Um, Um, sitting is method. It's, okay, it's not the goal. So you, we sit down to get up in a different way. Do you see what I mean? These are good questions, yes. Um, can you explain the concept of maya? It's like as illusion. I think it's really tricky. I can't get my mind around it, oh. especially as it relates to no material culture in the world. Yeah. Are you are you sitting in um, Hindu tradition? No. I no. I don't really know how I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> I just started. But that you know, hearing about that idea of Maya, just an interesting concept. Okay. So the question is. Um, to say something about Maya. So Maya in Sanskrit means illusion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah very associated with the, the Sanskrit. It's very associated with the Hindu tradition. On the other hand, when you walked up the steps, you probably saw there was something on the wall that said, regard all dharmas as dreams. So it's a, so I can't get off the hook. <laughs> um, It's the notion, it's basically again the notion of egolessness, is that there's no, there's no substantiality, that things are, there's no substantiality. There's no, there's no permanent, there's no permanence. I mean, if someone said, if you had to do, explain Buddhism in one word, what would it be? It would be impermanence. So again, you have to, in order to explain it, you just you need to go a little bit below the surface of concepts to just our ordinary, our ordinary experience, everyday experience, just simple experience. And the notion of um, illusion in that sense is just is that things are shifty. You know, things are fundamentally shifty. They fundamentally uh, are impermanent. So now, now if all you, when you dig below the surface, you still have, here you are, your senses are open, so it's very vivid. It's, that, it's not that, in fact, it's more vivid than when you think about it. I think I have to close. Um, but it's, it's, things, at that level, things are very immediate, and it's, it's very um, rich, experiential level. And fundamentally, things are... It's like in Shambhala tradition, it said the basic goodness and the flowing of it. That things, are, things aren't stuck. They're flowing all the time. So it's like that. That's a short answer to a good question. Anything else? Anyone else? Any other question or comment? Yeah, thanks for coming. I would, we're going to um, come back, you know, come to sittings. This obviously is our major sitting room. So what do you recommend like, to experience it more, like from an experiential experience? <laughs> 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 oh, as far as Shambha. I mean, you give it oh, a I would good, do. good explanation of something. I just get this sense that you can kind of just feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. So how does one experience all of this? It really is, it's a mix. I mean, you kind of have to mix. I'm giving you a true answer, like or how I experienced it. 
is you, it takes a certain amount of energy and exertion, and you, it takes, and it's kind of messy in a way. Like, um, you have to mix time on the cushion, study, you know, with study, read, read these texts, um, and with group support, so they're group sittings, because it's, very, unless you're unusual, it's very hard to actually sit, you know, be disciplined. Um, there's Shambhala training that we offer, you know, which is both study and experience. But honestly, it's very zigzag. It's like life. And you have to put in some effort. Um, and don't be discouraged. Like when you study, you read something and you go, wow, that's really right. You know, you turn the page and you can't remember what you read. <laughs> but that's what they say. That's when, That's what it looks like. Like when you're... You know, it gets, it sounds really real, and the next moment we're on to the next thing, or we, you know, that's when it's going, but when it's going in deep, it's just building up, building up insight, and questioning, testing, testing it on the cushion, investigate, 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 so it's just kind of messy, <laughs> and worth it. Okay, so since we bowed in, let's bow out. <laughs>